Good morning, everyone. We're live, finally. A um, little bit of technical issue there to start off with. I listed the video as private and then couldn't figure out why anyone was online. Anyway, we're back online now. Um, so yes, it's 9 a.m. here in New Zealand. It is 7 a.m. on the east coast of Australia. It is 9 p.m. in Berlin, 8 p.m. in the UK. And it is the um, on Sunday at just gone 3 p.m. on the east coast of North America and on the west coast. It is um, just gone 11 a.m. I believe, 12 p.m. actually. So thank you very much for joining me. Today I'm going to be talking about sharing team. Now what is sharing team? Sharing team is this idea of sharing images or videos online of um, people that we love, um, kids mainly. This is what we're talking about here today. And um, whether that's a good idea or not, or whether we should be a little bit more wary about what we share online um, about our children. Uh, and things about identity, what it says about us, what it says about our needs as parents or grandparents or people who are related to thinking about our children's needs and whether it's um, really something that we should be doing less of. Now, despite the heated kind of responses that sharing team can evoke, it's interesting that it's actually not anything that's really new. For centuries, people have been recording their daily minutiae of life in diaries and scrapbooks and all kinds of different things like that. Uh, what's different today is that the spread of what it is that we share about our children and um, other people that we care about. In this era of what's been called kind of mass surveillance, really, it's possible that um, the parents are sharing images of their children in things in um, data centers that possibly aren't all that secure. So we perhaps have uh, an idea as to what it is that we want to achieve by sharing this information. But actually what we uh, end up doing is um, sharing it into places where uh, we don't have a lot of control over who gets to see that information and um, it's possibly hackable and shareable too. Now, you may think that this is actually something um, paranoid, but actually there are cases where this has happened over and over again where people have actually had to disclose that data has been leaked or shared with people uh, who didn't have permission. So we're getting wiser about the dangers of oversharing, um, but enough people are still doing it that we do need to seriously think about the consequences. So that's what we're talking about today. Why, what the consequences might be, and what it is that we need to be mindful of if we think we want to continue doing this. I do it. Um, most parents I know do it, but thinking about how we do it is something that we need to be um, thinking more about. So what does the research say? Who does it? Now it's interesting because um, it says that, um, the research seems to indicate that it's mothers. It's mothers who tend to post more information about their children on social media. And that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, um, but what I'm talking about is that it's mainly women who tend to be the custodians of things like family photos or family memories. That's just how it happens. And it's also the mothers, unfortunately then, who become the focus for disapproval and judgment when it comes for their sharing things. So not only are they the custodians, but because they're doing all this activity, then they're the ones that get the flack for it as well. So why do we do it? Well, there's a number of reasons, which I'm gonna delve into a little bit more in this video. Uh, one of the things is around pride. It's around uh, a demonstration of good parenting, perhaps. And it's also to try to ease and meet the social pressure because everybody else seems to be doing it. I feel like I need to step up and do this too. But it's also for self-validation, the idea that actually I am a good parent and this was successful and I'm going to record this and I'm going to share it to make me feel better too, which is understandable too. Things go wrong all the time. Uh, and when you have a success, it's something that you perhaps want to celebrate, particularly if we're living in atomized communities. More and more these days, we're doing these experiences by ourselves. So one of the things I want to just signal as well is that this is going to be a regular fortnightly um, live stream that I'm going to be doing. And the next one that I'm going to be doing is going to be on the, I think it will be the 17th of February, and it's going to be on parental burnout, which I'll also be talking about on Radio New Zealand later on in the month. So what are the downsides of sharing tech? Well, it has been framed as something like a permanent digital tattoo for children in this age of what's been called surveillance capitalism, where we kind of are giving away our data for free. We're constantly going to be able to track our children or other people are going to be able to track our children as a result of sharing our images and videos on the net. 
Now, children are becoming more and more wise and vocal about their own digital rights and views about rights of ownership of their own images and their, their content, other content that they're involved in. So that's something that's a new development too. Do we need to ask our children's permission or at least make them aware that this is going to be happening, that there's going to be a digital footprint that's going to be about them, uh, which potentially employers or other people are going to be able to check about them as well relatively easily. All right, so let's delve down a little bit here in, in terms of detail. I want to talk a little bit first about the sorts of diaries and the way that people kind of re recall and, and share this information. So you've got things like, you know, if you're looking at the sort of pen and paper, old school way of recording what it is that your child's doing, it starts off with baby books where you've got parents invited to log information about their children, perhaps the generations that came before them, their first kind of you know time that they did a particular thing hitting particular milestones and you record that but it's more for your own use now this kind of impulse that we have to document and share information has been described by a scholar called lee humphreys as a form of media accounting so this is the idea that throughout our lives people occupy many roles child spouse, parent, friend, colleague. And one way to perform these roles is by documenting them. By then you can look back on these traces that you've recorded and that helps you to, shell, to shape a sense of self, to construct a coherent life story and it helps you to feel connected to others. This is who I am. These are the things that I have done. This means that I am this kind of a person. This is myself. It gives me a sense of who I am and perhaps who I want to be. And what are the changes that I want to make? And, you know, I've long thought that actually we don't really have a sense of self unless we think about this narrative structure. What is it that I've done? Because sometimes we're a mystery to ourselves. We can't figure it out. It's only when we look and make sense of what it is that we've done in the context of everything else that we can either fit it in or it feels jarring. And we need to do something about that if it, if it does. But have you ever thumbed through perhaps like an old yearbook or perhaps your grandparents travel photos or, or what it is that their lives were like or perhaps even a historical figures diary if you don't have access to those sorts of things if you've done any of that you've looked at media accounts it's the same if you've um, scrolled through blog archives or even in your own facebook timeline when you look through though that your history when facebook serves you up all that stuff if you've opted into it um, of on this day, that is an immediate, that is a media account. So social media might be fairly new, but it's a, just a different form of expression of this act of recording of everyday life. Uh, but this time it's kind of served up in front of you rather than you having to go out and dig it out. Now writing about perhaps family life online can help parents to express themselves as well creatively and connect with other parents. And media accounting, this sorts of thing, helps people make sense of their new social identity as a parent. It's a new thing. It's something that we have to rehearse. It's something that we have to get used to. It's interesting. There's been quite a lot of um, media um, talk over the last few days here in New Zealand about the experience of fathers in prison uh, and how it is that they get to rehearse or uh, perform the um, role that they have of being a father and whether they have the space or permission to be able to do that with their kind of persona that they have to have in prison is a very different persona that perhaps they need to learn how to be as a father and particularly in that confined space where you're not able to move and a child being invited into that space can be threatening. I'm going to talk about models, you know, there's some models in Wales and other places where um, they've been thinking quite creatively about how to perform that. So this idea of media accounting also is about how to see myself as a parent compared to other parents. So it involves talking and writing about your children, perhaps, and your relationship to them. So thinking about judgment, then, of parents who share too much. So, you know, whilst we have everyone kind of like sharing things about children, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all of these people share images online. Research shows it's, like I said before, mothers who post more information about their children on social media in general. You might not be one of them, but in general, particularly when it comes to family photos. And it's also the mothers who cop the most flat, get the most disapproval and judgment for their sharing team. And those people who are irritated by sharing team, you might be one of those people who doesn't have kids, you're not interested in kids, and you're on, a, in that case, I don't know why you're watching this video, but anyway, you might be one of those people. 
Um, and you, they describe their posts, these sharing team posts, as dull or repetitive or just plain annoying. And some people find it irritating enough to actually set up groups um, such as STFU parents formed around the idea that they're being driven crazy by baby and child updates in their social networks. And it's also been criticised as a, a form of digital narcissism. But more than this, it's been seen as one long parental humble brag defined as an ostensibly modest or self-decorating statement whose actual purpose is to draw attention to something of which someone is proud. Now, this link is interesting, isn't it, between humble bragging and pride. So it suggests that parents and mothers in particular face a real ethical struggle here about posting around their children and families online. Because while pride can take on both positive and negative connotations, it's also an emotion associated with good parenting, right? Why would I not be proud if something's kind of gone well or my child has hit a, an achievement that they've been working hard for and I want to share that, that I'm proud of them. And it's it's been shown in the research that actually expressions of parental pride are associated with the moral development of children and on good quality child raising. Uh, and on all of that, um, you know, we, we, we depend on that for good child outcomes. So there was some research that was done where the researchers asked 15 mothers to show some of their posts about children and family and tell them about their experiences. And they found that mothers were most likely to use the word proud when posting about their children in relationship to specific achievements like competitions or passing exams. And so it's not it's not that surprising, given that pride is a social expectation of good parenting, that when they see that, they don't see their expression as of pride in that context of competitions and achievement as a problem at all. And they see it as actually a really good justification for doing that. So what we see is that the expressions of parental pride online and the expectations of doing that actually starts to put social pressure and demands upon parents. And they feel like they're socially expected to invest heavily in terms of time, care and labour so that they can hit those achievements so that they can post them online. It's strange, isn't it? This pressure actually might be a good thing in terms of, you know, it's, it's asking parents to up their game in terms of making sure your child hits those achievements. Now that's me putting a positive spin on that. There are also some darker sides to that too. The expectation is that your child is going to thrive. Not only that, but they're going to excel in relationship to their peers. And so posting online is one way that parents can perhaps satisfy this demand that they're performing as parents. So it's interesting because it also then becomes uh, perhaps a potential source of conflict because these digital demonstrations of good parenting become increasingly complicated as children grow older. Uh, and so one example of this is um, a case that I came across in some research where there was a family argument around a young girl's rights over an unflattering school photo posted by her proud dad on Facebook. Now the daughter disliked the photo enough to report her father to Facebook's administrators when he refused to take the post down she actually started to exercise her own agency and rights around influencing something that was about her in the digital domain that she could do something about. She was worried that she was going to be, it was going to be seen by her friends and classmates and she would receive negative comments at school. However, her mother told the researchers that Facebook supported the father's rights to keep the post in circulation in this case. So it's an interesting conflict here, isn't it? What's a source of pride for parents can be a source of disruption to a child's life, both on and offline. And so it's interesting, isn't it? Some, some research has showed that mothers um, try to negotiate this ethical dilemma by um, keeping everyone involved. So they treat their online sharing as a means of maintaining close connections and relationships with others in their social relationships. So what they're trying to do is that they're trying to um, share this material as a way of kind of smoothing out or keeping those relationships going online. And they um, said, these mothers said that they wanted to express something about the closeness of their family and something genuinely nice about their children. And so in this case, it's not just about pride, it's that these mothers want to express their love and care for their children in the digital age and they would be checking in with their children to see whether this was okay or not 
And so we come to the point there where we need to start actually taking children's views on this seriously. You know, it's an image that you may have taken as a parent or as an adult of a child, but actually it's the child who is the subject of that photo. So in this case, do we need to be worrying about it? Because um, as we've seen, there are pros and cons of it. And so there's some research that's been done by, oh, sorry, there's a message that's come in here through here. Okay, this one's working fine, good. Um, Sonia Livingston, Professor of Social Psychology in the Department of Media and Communication, the LSE, um, was talking about some of her research. And she said that actually they interviewed several families where even small children, little children, wish their parents would share fewer photos and consult them more. And they observed that in a few families, children are even learning to uh, tell their parents to stop. But where families are geographically dispersed, the children also appreciated that there were advantages too. And so their conclusion was that it was a matter of respect and consent and protecting is that is more important, more important than the actual fact of sharing itself. And so that's interesting, isn't it? Because I think there's more and more views like clinical psychologist or um, Genevieve Von Lobb, clinical psychologist, and she's the author of a book called Five Deep Breaths, The Power of Mindful Parenting. And what she says is that uh, more and more parents are questioning the wisdom of posting so much about their kids online. The pictures that are uploaded can form a permanent digital tattoo because it's also new for parents. We need to start thinking about asking children's permission to post online. And so what she says is that children will learn their own online behaviours from their parents and asking us to perhaps challenge ourselves with this question. Are we leading with a positive, respectful, appropriate example? Are we modelling what you think before you share online? And if parents are posting things online to just get likes, it's about getting validation from others. And it's important that kids aren't learning that posting photographs of themselves or others is a way of getting validated. Because this is an external source of validation. If you're constantly chasing external sources of validation for your own sense of self-worth, you're not going to stop. You really need to be thinking about are there other ways of getting validation for what it is you're doing as a parent other than posting things online and perhaps getting validation from people who you don't really know that well. So I guess the thing is that it's not reasonable to ask people to stop this behaviour altogether uh, because social media is a fact of life now and there are benefits to that too. And we said, you know, there are so many positive examples where social media works well. You get to feel supported. You get practical advice. You get reassurance. And it can be really lonely if you've been with your kids all day long. And putting putting um, putting pictures online is a way of connecting. It's a way of getting a response from other parents and other adults too. But I do think perhaps parents need to keep in mind how those children are going to feel, not just now, but in the future. Will they feel embarrassed by that photo, that video? Will they feel ashamed? Will they feel anxious? Will they feel annoyed? Will you feel, do your, do your kids feel empowered enough to say, I don't feel happy about you putting this online? Because if you're not careful, you could affect your future relationship with your children if you haven't asked their permission now. Because once it's out there, it's out there and it gets spread and it's hard to take down in its entirety because it's replicated on many different servers and then goes out into different services. It's really hard to delete. So do think, if, particularly if it's something that, you know, your kid having a tantrum or something like that, um, that could negatively affect them or give a, something that's quite embarrassing later on. And it's interesting to think, will we ever get to the point where children are routinely suing their parents? because this has been suggested for exposing their childhoods online. And some people think that this is not impossible. Um, in Europe, we have the general data protection regulation that comes into that has come into force um, because if parents are putting photos up without their children's consent, they could argue later on that they have the right to take those photos down. And they might consider that they have a reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to some of the information that in, their parents are putting out there. Uh, and that could apply to medical information, that could apply to pictures taken even in the parental home. So it's interesting, we'll have to see how this kind of plays, it plays out. Now, I kind of talked a little bit about um, economic dangers and surveillance capitalism when I open up this video. So let me just go back to that there a second. 
because too often, I, I guess the um, what we've talked about so far is the relationship between parents and children, and often the public discourse kind of pits them against each other. And I don't want to just fall completely into that trap because actually it's not just about narcissism. It's not just about parents just not really blindly caring what their child thinks about this. It's actually thinking about um, the idea that actually a typical parent has about 150 Facebook friends and only about a third of them are actual friends. So thinking about this question, who are we really sharing this information with and why? And so friends like this, then it actually thinks about, you actually start thinking about where the information is being held and who it's visible to when they're scrolling down their feed online. So thinking about what corporations do with the data that you're putting online, because it's not like a photo album or a photo book, which you whip out and put on the coffee table when somebody comes around. It's open to perhaps everyone. And so the terms by which your media accounting happen nowadays have changed drastically to how they did before. Because unlike diary entries, photo albums and home videos that you did before, blog posts, hey Tim, how are you doing? Blog posts, Instagram photos, YouTube videos, they all reside in platforms owned by corporations and can be made visible to far more people than you may realize or expect. And the problem is that it's less about parents these days, but it's more about the social media platforms. And the platforms increasingly operate to an economic logic that people have called surveillance capitalism. So they produce goods and services that are designed specifically to extract enormous amounts of data from individuals and they mine that data for patterns and they use that data to influence people's behavior for their own ends. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stop sharing this stuff, but just be mindful that it's going to be used for purposes that you don't necessarily know right now, and also for purposes that haven't really been thought of yet in the future too. So social media uses sharing posts for um, trying to commodify you, essentially. Sharing tells you tells them what your child looks like, uh, when she was born, what she likes to do, uh, when she hits her developmental milestones and more than that. And they pursue a business model of knowing their users, perhaps even more deeply than they know themselves and using that knowledge to their own ends. So the concern is less that you talk about your kids online and more on the places where you spend time online and are owned by companies which want access to every corner of your life. So Facebook is really, really popular. And that's the positive and the downside of it is that, yeah, you can reach tons of people, tons of people who you know that are geographically away from you who are connected to you via Facebook. But really think very carefully about who you share your posts with, all your privacy settings around that. And even then, there are ways that Facebook track you that you don't know about. And there are posts online, I can find one for you and I'll put it in the description of this video where you can really start to take control and have some more knowledge about how that data is used and how it creeps into every single corner of how it is that you browse and um, spend time online. So just in the final part of this, um, I just want to think a little bit about um, some of the other hazards around sharing team. Um, Veronica Barassi, who is a media and communications lecturer at Goldsmiths in the University of London, um, and she's uh, interested in the Child Data Citizen Research Project. So interested that, in fact, she's leading it. And she says that there's a bit of a moral panic going on about sharing pictures online. But at the same time, she admits that there are dangers. And she says, if you think about big data and how children are being profiled on the basis of social media images, there is a real risk. I'm particularly interested in things like facial recognition, the way in which data is sold and the lack of transparency and the most worrying aspect of so-called sharing, that lack of transparency. So she gives an example, parents posting pictures of their children at political demonstrations. And thinking back to what she said was a picture posted on her own private Instagram account of her child at an anti-Trump rally in London. And she felt like it gave somehow the child a political agency in some way. But if but parents are tending not to think about the fact that that's created a political trace that then can be tracked in the future. 
And it's important that we start thinking about the way in which data is bought and sold without us knowing and used. So alongside educational and medical information, social media is one tiny dimension of the data traces that are produced about children today and it will become increasingly more and more important when decisions are made about that child as well. Yes, Tim, there are benefits in data collecting uh, while they use it to data, uh, target uh, advertising uh, and it can filter out what's irrelevant for us. Yes, if we're thinking about what's coming to and from us with that relationship. But what I'm saying is that actually that data is used for many, many other things that aren't necessarily about what's being fed to us. It's about shaping um, that corporate's um, whole mission around how it is and they learn about people and then targeting other activities which aren't necessarily just about what that platform is doing in a transparent way. And we've seen examples of what's going on behind the scenes that have been revealed to us later on. So. You're thinking about the long-term implications perhaps of the digital footprint that you're now setting out for your child. So what should you do? Uh, so one of the things is thinking about um, what our parents doing right now and what can we learn from them? One of the things that you can do is to really think about what's the sort of light that you're casting upon your child. And some parental bloggers and people who are sharing these images are now really thinking about taking care only to present their child in a positive light. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Because somehow sharing or sharing what it is speaks to this idea of somehow we're being authentic, somehow we're sharing everything in our lives, but we know that that's not true. There's lots of research that actually people tend to present this kind of like super best self of themselves on social media. And some parents are now saying that actually there's a disparity here. I'm posting all this stuff about my child having a tantrum or embarrassing things that they've worn or them looking kind of geeky and goofy. And that's really not fair when I carefully curate what it is that I share with the world about what I'm doing so that I'm presenting myself in the best light. So actually what they're starting to do now is to present their child in their best light too. But that can be problematic too because you're now starting to create an ideal best self which now your child could feel pressure to live up to. When they are conscious enough and, and, and available enough on social media themselves, they see this digital footprint of themselves and they go, ah, actually, that's not me. I Maybe this is me. Maybe this is something now I feel like I have to live up to, but that doesn't feel like the totality of me. So there are pros and cons of that too. Now, for the rest of us who have no intention of perhaps, you know, using our photographs for commercial gain um, with our with our child, um, we need to be thinking about um, keeping our sharing thing to a minimum. Perhaps we do what we want to do to share with friends and family, but sharing on public sites maybe is not something that we want to engage in. That's not something perhaps that most parents are in the position to do now, but it's something that perhaps we need to be thinking about in the future. So there are certain things that you should and shouldn't do. So here's an example here I want to leave us with just as I got to sign off for this half hour live stream this morning. This is Bex Lewis, Senior Lecturer in Digital Marketing at Manchester Metropolitan University and author of a book called Raising Children in a Digital Age. I'll stick a few links here uh, in the description afterwards. Try not to put your child's school uniform in. Try not to show that you have a regular pattern every day. Most parents, you would hope, wouldn't post pictures of their children naked, for example. But there are other things parents should perhaps think twice about. It's probably not fair to show pictures of a child having a meltdown, although they're quite funny to watch. Turn off your geotagging, which tells internet users where you are and lock down your privacy settings as much as possible. And even then, there's always a chance someone could screenshot the pictures, but someone could take a picture of your child in the park. And if you thought you'd never go anywhere, um, sorry, and if you thought like you'd never go anywhere, that, that you know, that doesn't really make sense. But, um, you, you know, people, there's, there's a danger there around how people are surveilling your child anyway, but the internet just makes it much more available. Keep your child involved in the conversation about what's being shared about them as much as you can from an early age. The digital world is such an everyday part of our lives now that we can't really avoid sharing 
um, stuff about our children online. And it's still evolving. So I'm not sure that there are any fixed rules that we can stick to here, but we need to have a little bit of thought about where we're posting, why we're posting. And I think that remains the critical thing to be doing this mindfully rather than blindly sharing information with others where we're not sure what's going to happen with it if we really think about it. Okay, that's me done for today. Thanks so much for joining me, Tim. Um, I will be putting this up as a post on my uh, channel, The Useful Psychologist, shortly. And I'll also be posting some links about some of the books that I've mentioned today so that if you're interested, you can take those out too. Hey, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, this will be a regular fortnightly thing on a Monday morning. Cheers and go well.